Jim and Jordan today, and uh, we're in for a treat talking about manual or something. Yeah, that's what I was going to talk about. Okay. Uh, the one we uh, open with the word of prayer, Barry, can you uh, start us off? Father, we're always thankful for the Sabbath that we have on your house and worship for the Today we set aside, Lord, just to give glory and honor to you and to study your word. We thank you for Jim coming today. And just pray that he'll have travel mercies as he goes back home or wherever he goes from here. And just pray to bless what he says this morning that uh, we'll be tentative to hearing your words. You would have it spoken by him and he would have clarity in his voice. Christ in my prayer. Amen. Well, let's see. I, uh... I had thought to, to uh, talk a bit about Daniel chapter 3, and then on the way over here I thought, well, uh, maybe I should just say some general words about Daniel, but you all ask questions if you want, so we can, we can keep this pretty informal. Uh, the book of Daniel we, we tend to be afraid of uh, because it's the second half of it's full of prophecies, and uh, I think a lot of times Reformed people when they look at how the, our fundamentalist brothers uh, do nothing but prophecy, our tendency is to come back and say, well, we'll just bracket those parts of the Bible and not worry about it. But, of course, uh, the answer to doing a bad job with the Bible is to do a good job with it. And so we really do want to take uh, Revelation and Daniel and Zechariah and these parts of the Bible that uh, our brothers sometimes uh, turn into fantasies and, and try to do a good job with them. And so let me say a few words about when Daniel lived and what's going on. Daniel is a disciple of Jeremiah. And so uh, to understand the book of Jeremiah, uh, Daniel, we've got to look at the last part of the kingdom of Judah. You'll remember that after Solomon's reign, the kingdom of Israel divided into two parts, north and south. It's like Jacob and Esau, or Cain and Abel. Uh, this is a period of brother-brother strife throughout this whole, this whole kingdom time. It started out with David's sons fighting against each other. And the theme of brother-brother strife continues throughout this period uh, of the king. So you have northern Israel, southern Israel, and they have conflicts with other nations. And in order, for, and in order to keep northern and southern Israel from tearing each other apart... God would bring in enemy nations from time to time and force them to kind of, uh, both, both of them would have to deal with the enemy nation, like Syria, or what the Bible calls Aram. Well, that's in the middle part of the history of the kings. Toward the end of the history of the kings, God raised up the kingdom of Assyria, not Syria. Reading the Bible about Syria. Now we are at Assyria, no relation. Its capital was Nineveh. The first thing God did with Nineveh was to send Jonah there to convert them. And so the, the, the Assyrians had been a real warlike people, and then we know from history that for about 75 years they settled down and, and didn't go around conquering people anymore. Then they started conquering again. And they were more powerful than before because... If the gospel comes to a people, it releases their creativity. And so God was in a sense raising up the Assyrians for two reasons, to make them strong, and also to make them into a place where there would be believers. So that when northern Israel was taken into captivity to Assyria, they found there were believers there, and so they had kind of a soft landing. And Jonah prepared this way for them. Well, Assyria comes in, it conquers northern Israel. Okay? Let's get our map here. Just a little symbolic map. Okay, here's... We have north and south. South is called Judah. North is called Ephraim. This part is conquered by Assyria, taken off into exile. And... This is when kind of riffraff type people were moved in here. The Assyrians would move people all around. So now it's just the kingdom of Judah. And the good king Hezekiah, he sends messengers up here and says, 
All true believers move down here and be with us and worship the Lord. So they do. And the Assyrians try to conquer Hezekiah. But God protects the kingdom of Judah from Assyria. But we now we move down another century or so, and the Assyrians are beginning to get weak, and another force is rising up, Babylon. For 55 years, in the kingdom of Judah, we have a king named Manasseh, who is the most wicked king ever. Manasseh tried to stomp out the true religion. He burned all the copies of the Bible that he could find. There were no copies of the scriptures left that anybody knew about. He instituted pagan religion. He even offered his children up as burnt offerings to pagan gods. And imagine now for 50 years, okay, how many of you are over 50? Now, your entire life, ever since you were 7 or 8 years old, you've lived under Manasseh. There's been no Bible. There's been no teaching. Alright? That's a long time. Now you get to our age, 58, 75, really. You get to this age, and you really don't know anything at all. Except maybe you've got some tradition that once upon a time, we in Judah, we had our own God, Yahweh. All right. Now, Manasseh, in the last five years of his life, repented and tried to undo what he'd done. Which is good. But he uh, wasn't very successful. After him, comes for two years, his son Ammon, and then King Josiah comes along. Josiah is important because Josiah is again a righteous king. Josiah starts out as king at eight years of age, but he decides to serve the Lord when he's 18. And when he's 20, he leads an army and he goes up and he reconquers northern Israel from Assyria. And he reunifies the nation of Israel. This is real important. The nation was unified under Saul and David and Solomon. And Josiah reunifies this nation. It's now Israel again. No longer Judah and northern Israel, but Israel. Josiah reunifies the nation right under Assyria's nose. He burns all the idols because Assyria is so weak that they can't do anything about it. God has raised up Babylon, and God has decided to put all of this world under Babylon. Now, when Josiah starts his reforms, a man who's about the same age as he is, named Jeremiah, is given to him as a pal and a buddy to help him with the Reformation. So they work for 27 or so years trying to bring about a Reformation in Israel. And Jeremiah... Tells all the people that God's plan is for Babylon to sort of have hegemony over all of this area, to rule it, to provide a context for Israel. Josiah agrees with him. But after Josiah dies, we have a series of bad kings who are, they kind of have an anything but Nebuchadnezzar mindset. Right after Josiah dies, Nebuchadnezzar comes to the throne. Neb, you, had, Nezer. This is the god Nabu. Okay. Nebu Zaradan. Nebu Hashbaz. You see this name a lot. Uh, Nebu had Nezer. Okay. Servant of Nebu. Okay, he comes to the throne. He's about 20 years old. He comes to Jerusalem. He tells Jerusalem, I'm in charge now. I'm in charge of all this. I'm just still going around letting everybody know that we're in charge now. And uh, I, want, I want you uh, Israelites to send over to my university here in Babylon 
your best students. I want men who are from the princely houses and from the royal house to come over to Babylon to be educated. Because, you see, uh, I'm kind of new to this king stuff, and I need wisdom. Kings rule by wisdom. In fact, you Jews have said that in the book of Proverbs and other places. Uh, and I want to be a wise king. I want to be a good king. So I'm collecting wise men from all the nations I've, I've conquered, and I'm bringing them back to Babylon so they can advise me and help me out. And I want to bring some of you Jewish... I mean, I've heard that you Jews are wise and you've got this wisdom tradition. I want some of your wisest young men to come back with me to Babylon to go to the University of Babylon for three years and be educated. And that's when Daniel and his friends go back. They're about 18 years old. Now, who are they? They're members of the remnant. Okay? You've got two churches in Israel. You've got the mainline churches. And then you've got the Confederation of Reformed Evangelistic Jews, the CRE Jews, or remnant, Confederation of Remnant Evangelical Churches, all right? CREC. And uh, in Jerusalem, First Memorial, First Elijah Memorial Remnant Synagogue has four pastors. The pastors are named Jeremiah, and who are the other three pastors of Elijah Memorial? Synagogue in Remnant Synagogue in Jerusalem, you know? Zephaniah, Habakkuk, and Nahum. Those four guys are contemporaries. They are the Sunday school teachers or Saturday school teachers of Azael, Azariah, Mishael, Daniel, and Ezekiel. All those guys are the same age. All five were born in the same year. All of them are members of the remnant church. All of them are disciples of Jeremiah. All of them are very familiar with the temple. They're all from Jerusalem. They are all from noble houses. Daniel and his friends are of the nobility of Israel. As it saith in Daniel chapter 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon to Jerusalem and laid siege to her. And my master, that's the Lord, gave into his hand Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and a slice of the vessels of the house of the God, and brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his gods, and the vessels he put into the treasury house of his gods. Now we want to remember that because in the sermon, they're going to take these vessels out at Belshazzar's big bread. We're going to talk about that. Okay, and the king ordered Ashpenaz, greatest of the court officials, to bring from the sons of Israel, that is, from the seed of the kingdom, royal house, and from the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, good of appearance, skillful in all wisdom. See, that's what Nebuchadnezzar wants. He wants wise people to help him out. This, Nebuchadnezzar is a good king. Uh, the great evangelical scholar uh, E.J. Wiseman wrote a, a monograph on Nebuchadnezzar and showed how in all the information we have from secular sources about Nebuchadnezzar is that he was a very just king. He just was a pagan, you know. But already the Holy Spirit is stirring in him to look for wisdom. Young men in whom they're skillful in wisdom, knowers of knowledge, understanding knowledge, who are qualified to stand in the palace of the king and to give him advice. That's what he wants. So, in a sense, the, the Spirit is already stirring in this man, Nebuchadnezzar, to make him search for truth. So here are these disciples of Jeremiah. And they come from Jerusalem. They come 20 years before Jerusalem is destroyed. This is an important thing, because we read Daniel, and we read it's like it happened over here. And then we read Jeremiah, and it's like it happened over here. And we read the history of the kings. We have to put all this together to get the actual picture of what's going on. Twenty years before Jerusalem is destroyed, these guys go over here and start being educated. Now, during this time, bad kings are ruling in Jerusalem, and the kings that rule in Jerusalem continue to be bad until the end. And that's why God keeps bringing Nebuchadnezzar back over and over again and finally destroys the city. 
Now, there's one other thing I have to tell you about what's going on at this time in history, and that is Egypt is down here, and Egypt is trying to balance the power of Babylon. And since these Jews don't want to be under Babylon, they don't like Nebuchadnezzar. They decide that they, they're not going to agree with Jeremiah. Jeremiah tells them, for the next 70 years, Babylon's in charge. Submit to Nebuchadnezzar. Everything will go well. That's what God wants you to do. And they say no. They keep looking to Egypt for help. Now there's a lot of politics back and forth, but essentially the kings and the nobility look to Egypt for help and Egypt stirs them up continually against Babylon. Now, if you look back to Egypt, is that good or bad? That's kind of by definition bad. Yeah. Yeah, we, we kind of have learned that over the years and it's going to be important. Well, Daniel goes over there and the people continue to look to Egypt and they continue to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. And finally Nebuchadnezzar comes and he sacks the city again. This time he takes back to Jerusalem a bunch of the nobility of Israel. Nobility. And he takes the gold out of the temple. The gold in the temple the nobility of Israel, those things are parallel conceptually. The most glorious part of the kingdom. Okay? And he puts them in covered wagons and new walls and he takes them back to Babylon and settles them along the Chebar Canal. And it's a pretty decent life. They dwell in houses. It's okay. He just, he just wants to remove these troublemakers from here. And he installs another king. And everybody says, oh yes, we'll do what you say, Ned. And so, but this 10,000 nobility have been taken over here. Among them is Ezekiel. Ezekiel is of the high priestly family. And five years after he's taken over here at the age of 30, God appears to Ezekiel in his chariot and anoints him as high priest. We know he's a high priest because he sees the cherubim, and that's in the Holy of Holies, and only the high priest ever goes in there. And we know he's high priest because when his wife dies, he's not allowed to mourn publicly. And that rule only applies to the high priest. And there's a lot of other things as well. In fact, last year, at the, two years ago, at the Evangelical Theological Society, a guy presented a whole paper on how uh, Ezekiel is high priest in exile and ran through all the stuff. So this is I'm not telling you anything strange here. This is garden variety stuff. Just that this part of the Bible we don't study very much. Ezekiel, at the age of 30, Daniel and his friends have been there for 10 years, 12 years. They've all known each other. You know, every year at Passover, they get together and visit Ezekiel, cook some home cooked meals. You know, they exchange emails back and forth. And they write back and forth to Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah and Ezekiel have letters back and forth to each other. These people are all in touch with each other. All right? Ezekiel tells us that because Jerusalem continues to look back to Egypt, that Jerusalem has become Egypt. And that people need to leave Egypt and come out here into Babylon. Well, if Jerusalem is Egypt, what is Babylon? And then we're going to go back from Babylon into the land. We go from Egypt to... And then we go into the land. What is... Wilderness. wilderness. What did God do in the wilderness? He took care of us. And what did He speak on Mount Sinai? Ten Commandments. All right? Now there are ten sections in the book of Daniel and they follow the Ten Commandments. One of the things Daniel is is a new application of the Ten Commandments. The fifth story in Daniel that we'll look at today is all about fathers and mothers. And it's about how Belshazzar did not honor his father and worship the wrong God. And how he does come to honor his mother when she brings Daniel in to speak to him. The fourth chapter of Daniel is about Nebuchadnezzar's insanity and how long was he insane? Seven periods of time. Okay, So we're into a Sabbath consideration. The sixth chapter of Daniel is Daniel in the lion's den. 
They try to kill Daniel, and then they get killed. Lion for lion, or tooth for tooth. Okay, you can find this, this, this book here. It gives you the clockwork of these, how Daniel, the book of Daniel, is set up to give us a new exposition of the Ten Commandments in this new wilderness. So we're out here with God. We're eating manna. See, right at the beginning of the book, Daniel and his friends decide they're not going to eat from the buffet that the king sets out. And they ask, your Bible says they ask for vegetables, but that's not right. It says they ask for seeds. Okay. What did manna look like? Coriander seeds. What's the other word for coriander? Cilantro is what we call it around here. Cilantro, coriander seeds. Okay? What did they eat? They ate the same stuff Ezekiel ate. They ate Ezekiel bread. Remember Ezekiel chapter 4? God says, you know, you take wheat and millet and spelt and all these and beans and you make bread out of it. That's all seeds. Okay? Seeds that you grind up. It's like mammoths. They don't eat that the whole 70 years here in Babylon. But both Ezekiel at the beginning of his ministry and Daniel at the beginning of his ministry, they start out on a bread and water diet. On a manna and water diet. Part of being back in the wilderness. Well now the interesting thing about Daniel, and this is, this is where we have to start putting it back in. Plugging it back into this history. Nebuchadnezzar has come. Jeremiah says, Nebuchadnezzar is in charge of the world. Submit to Nebuchadnezzar. And they keep rebelling against him. Well, at the end of Daniel chapter 1, I think I'm going to be easier to do it out of here. At the end of Daniel chapter 1, At the end of the days, this is verse 18, at the end of the time when the king is specified for presenting them, at the end of the three years of education, when they're about 20, 21 years old, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king talked to them, and out of them not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers in his realm, and they enter the king's personal service. So now the word goes back to Jerusalem. Hey guys, Daniel and three of his buddies, they have become high officials in Babylon. They're part of the wise men. Jeremiah is telling everybody at the remnant church about this, and they're all real happy. And but the first Jerusalem Times, you know, what they report is four traitors have entered into Nebuchadnezzar's service. And all the rest of the Jewish boys who were taken over there were, were not found worthy enough. The Jewish boys who continued to eat the king's food uh, and didn't go along with Daniel and his friends, you know, they, they flunked out. Now, Jerusalem Times is not interested in these guys, these traitors who were serving Nebuchadnezzar. Well, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, chapter 2, this is right after Daniel graduates. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, and in his dream he sees that his kingdom is not going to endure. He sees a statue and he sees it blown away. And at least he knows this much. This dream means my kingdom is not going to endure. And he wants to know what it means. And he's, and he's a shrewd young guy here. He's about 23 or 24. And he says, you know what? I can find out which of my wise men really has an inside track with the gods. So he calls all the, the chief wise men in. Of course, Daniel, I mean, these are the 70-year-old guys. Daniel and his friends, they're not called in initially for this. And he says, now all you guys are wise, right? Oh, yes, King, live forever, we're wise. And uh, you have an inside track with the gods? Oh, yes, oh, King, we have an inside track with the gods. Well, then, I had this dream last night. Tell me what it is. And he said, well, and what it means? Well, hello, King. Tell us what the dream was. We'll tell you what it means. He said, no, I thought you had an inside track with the gods. Tell me the dream. And they say, well, now, no king has ever asked such a thing before. And he says, well, I'm asking it now. 
Tell me the dream. You claim to be wise. Tell me the dream or I'm going to kill you. In fact, what he says is, and this is, this is important in a sense. Uh, well, it's all important. Sorry. Uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't waste his breath. But he says this. Uh, Yeah. Verse 4. The king replied to the Chaldeans. These are the super wise guys. The command from me is firm. If you don't make known to me the dream and this interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. Actually, you will be cut in pieces and your houses will be made a rubbish heap. Now, you may say, well, that's, that's an interesting thing. What's interesting about it is... This is exactly what Josiah did to the idol worshippers at the idol shrines. So if we put the book of Kings, which comes before this in a sense, here, we see Nebuchadnezzar as a new Josiah. He threatens the pagan worshippers with being cut in pieces and their houses torn down, which is exactly what Josiah did with the idol worshippers. So the way the text is written... Uh, the Holy Spirit is working here to make these parallels and show us Nebuchadnezzar is a guy who doesn't like false gods. Well, when, when they hear about it, Daniel asks for an extra 24 hours. At midnight during the night, God reveals the truth to him. See, like all the midnight Passover events in the Bible, right at midnight, the new covenant is made in Zechariah. At midnight... Uh, Eutychus falls out of the window and Paul raises him to life again. At midnight, the ship starts to sink in Acts 27 and Paul breaks bread and they say to people, I mean, midnight, midnight, midnight. At midnight, Daniel is told the truth. He goes back and tells the king what it means. And then in chapter 2, verse 46, then did King Nebuchadnezzar fall on his face and do homage to Daniel gave orders to present to him an offering and fragrant incense. That doesn't mean they burned incense in front of Daniel. That means that he gave some bread and some incense for Daniel to go home and use in the worship of Daniel's God. So Nebuchadnezzar is beginning to say that Daniel's God, is, he's a pretty cool God. In fact, he's better than all the other gods because he's the only God who could tell the meaning, tell the dream. King answered Daniel and said, Surely your God is a God of gods. He's a super God. And a Lord of kings, a revealer of mysteries, since you've been able to reveal this mystery. And the king promoted Daniel and gave him great gifts, made him ruler over Babylon province and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. And Daniel made a request to the king and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's Hanael, Azariah, and Mishael over the administration of province Babylon while Daniel was at the king's court. Now, this is, in, this is a year later. The word goes back to the Confederation of Roman Evangelical Churches. And everybody's happy. Daniel and these three guys, they're the chief advisor. They're in charge of Babylon province. Daniel is at the king's court. That means he's on the Supreme Court of Israel. Wouldn't that... Wouldn't that mean that if you were faithful Israelites, you'd be saying, yeah. You know, Jeremiah said we would serve Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar's got all the right guys. But you know what the Jerusalem Times said? It said, these guys are traitors, quizzes, the Benedict Arnolds. We need to go to Egypt for help. Now Ezekiel, a few years later, describes... Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem this way. Ezekiel is taken in a vision as lightning flashes from the east to the west. The Son of Man, Ezekiel, is brought to Jerusalem. And God says to him in this vision, in chapter 8 of Ezekiel, He says, I want you to dig through the walls of the, uh, of the temple. And He said, uh, Verse 5, Son of man, raise your eyes toward the north. I raised my eyes toward the north. And the north of the altar gate was an idol that provokes jealousy. Right in the temple of the Lord. Verse 7, He brought me to entrance of the court, and I looked, and behold, a wall 
a hole in the wall and he said, son of man, dig through the wall. So I dug through the wall. The wall is kind of soft. It's crumbly. This is the wall of God's house. You have to think about that. It's not hanging up. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations that they're committing there. So verse 10, I entered and looked and behold, every form of creeping thing and beast and detestable things with all the idols of the house of Israel were carved on the wall all around. Now, think about a wall with animal carvings all over it. What does that remind you of? An Egyptian temple. Because that's what hieroglyphs look like. You know, they're little birds and, and all these little animals. And they, they, that's what the Egyptian writing looks like. And they cover the walls with it. Okay. There's, there's a whole philosophy of that. Uh, if, if you are a tribal person, you put magical tattoos on your skin to protect you when you go into battle. Okay. You cut it into your skin. In Israel, the tattoo cut into the skin was circumcision. Okay. If you are a pagan and you've moved beyond being a tribal person into being a temple builder, you cover the temples with all kinds of magic signs carved into it to protect your temple. Okay. That's how it works. And he says the temple in Jerusalem, in a vision, looks just like an Egyptian temple. Why? Because they're looking to Egypt. Verse 11, standing in front of them were 70 elders of the house of Israel with Jaazaniah the son of Shaphan standing among them, each with a censer in his hand, the fragrance of the cloud of incense rising. You see what the elders of, Israel, of the house of Israel are doing? He said to me, in the dark in his heart. See, this is not a, the, the temple of Jerusalem didn't look like this. There was no idol of jealousy out there. In fact, the people were being very nationalistic outwardly, but he says in their hearts. They've got Egyptian temples in their hearts. Then he says, and we'll stop here, verse 16, we won't stop the lesson, we'll stop this part. He brought me to the inner court of the Lord's house and behold at the entrance to the temple of Yahweh between the porch and the altar were about 25 men. What are 25 men who are in the inner court? Who are they? The 24 chief priests together with the high priest okay these are the priests the top dog priests not the ordinary priests the 24 chief priests who are over the 24 courses of regular old priests plus the high priest 25 men with their backs to the temple of the lord and their faces toward the east and they were bowing down toward the sun kind of worship is that? Who worships the solar disk? The Egyptians. So Ezekiel says, and then they weren't really doing this. This is, this is not literal. He says, when they go into the temple and they say, oh, for everlasting is the loving kindness. Praise the Lord, our national God. He's going to defend us against everything. God is on our side. We're Americans. Nothing can stop us now. You know, God bless America. Or whatever. When they That's their nationalistic religion that they have here, God says in their heart they're behaving like Egyptians. And God is going to destroy them the same way He destroyed Egypt. Take them off into the wilderness. Well, at some point in these years, we find in the book of Kings that Jerusalem rebels against Nebuchadnezzar again. And when they do, we read in Jeremiah that messengers came to Jerusalem from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Syria, Egypt, Philistia. They all came together for a powwow in Jerusalem. And what were they doing? They were conspiring to rebel against Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Because something was going on. Okay. Now we don't know exactly when these things happened. But during one of these shakeups, Nebuchadnezzar decides that he's got to get everybody together to affirm his kingdom. And that's what we read in Daniel chapter 3, uh, which is actually written uh, uh, as a wrap. 
It's, uh, I'll read it to you as a rap. You have to have it literally, but this is, this is very deliberately written this way. And if, if you laugh, that's because you're supposed to. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold. Its height, 60 cubits. Its width, 6 cubits. He caused it to stand in the wall plain in Babylon province. And Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather the satraps, the deputies and the governors, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had caused to stand. So then assembled the satraps, the deputies and governors, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and the rulers of the provinces to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had caused to stand. They stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had caused to stand. And the herald called out with strength, To you it is commanded, O peoples, O nations, and O languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the trumpet, the double repipe, lyre, the trigon, dulcimer, drum, and all kinds of music, you can fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has called to stand. And whoever does not fall down and worship, at that moment he shall be cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Because of this, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the trumpet, the double repipe, the lyre, the trigon, the dulcimer, the drum, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had caused to stand. You hear that? Now what that is designed to do is give you a picture of this rote worship that's absolutely meaningless. And it continues on. Because of this, at that time, drew near mighty men Chaldeans and chewed up the pieces of the Jews. They answered and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live everlastingly. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the trumpet, the double repipe, the lyre, the trigon, the dulcimer, and drum, and all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. There are mighty men, Jews, whom you have appointed over the affairs of Babylon province, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. These mighty men, O king, have not heeded you with attention. Your gods they do not serve, and the golden image that you have caused to stand they do not worship. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, said to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these mighty men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that my gods there is no service from you, and the golden image that I have caused to stand you do not worship? Now, if you'd be ready at the time you hear the sound of the trumpet, the double repipe, the lyre, the trigon, the dulcimer, and drum, and all kinds of music, and it goes down. If you fall down and worship at that moment, you will be cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, It is not necessary for us in this matter to make a defense to you. If it be our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he from your hand, O king, will deliver us. And if not, let it be known to you, O king, that for your gods there will be no service from us. And the golden image that you have caused to stand, we will not worship. Now all of a sudden it totally breaks up all that rap rhythm. We have an entirely rational statement from these men. The uh, rote, meaningless ritual, fall down and do everything I say, is broken up by these men in their theological statement. All right? Now, I, we, we don't have time to read through all this. I wanted to make that point. Now, what is, what is Neb doing there? He's got everybody together to unify them because something's going on in the kingdom. All right? So he's got to get all the representatives of all the different peoples in the empire, have them stand. There's seven groups of people, there's seven musical instruments. At the time the musical instruments start to play, everybody's to fall down and do obeisance before the symbol of the empire. Now this symbol is probably an obelisk, okay? Just like the Washington Monument, okay? Uh, it represents a tower going up to heaven, and at the other end of this place is a burning fiery furnace. And there's a wall playing all around, and there are musicians all around, and this is a new temple. 
And these are Levites, counterfeit Levites, an altar at one end, a ladder reaching up to heaven at the other end, musical instruments. We read in Chronicles that when the ascension offering, the whole burnt offering began, all the instruments played, all the Levites sang, the people bowed down and worshipped, and that's what's being counterfeited here. Only the Lord's worship is full of content, and this is nothing but an empty ritual. It doesn't say that they're to say any words. No words are said to them, and they say no words back. In the Bible, we've got the whole book of Psalms, which is going on during the temple worship, which is two lines. God speaks, we speak. Why do the nations rage? The heathen imagine the vain thing. The kings of the earth take their stand. Rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against His anointed. You know, that's how the Psalms are made. A dialogue back and forth between the husband and the bride, the father and the children, the king and the people. There are no words here in Nebuchadnezzar. It's just a cement. And music is a cementing thing, isn't it? People have their own music. The 60s, we got our music band. Dude, got our music. You know, bills, or whatever. That's kind of old hat. But what happens in a church if you change the music? People don't like it. Music makes people feel at home. The music you feel at home with, you're at home with. And music creates cement, it creates community. That's why we sing a lot in the church. That's why no other religion sings. In, in Islam, people don't get together and sing. In paganism, there's no congregational song. It doesn't exist anywhere except where the Holy Spirit has been active. Then the devil tries to get it out of the church. You know, he tries to get the choir to do all the singing or, you know... Uh, to, to destroy congregational songs because it makes power, it unites. When the people are united, it's hard to with, withhold things from them. Okay? So Nebuchadnezzar, he understands this. He wants to unite everybody together. And then these three mighty men, and that's the word that's used here, Giboring, <clears throat> they refuse to go along with it. So they're cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace, which is heated seven times hotter than usual, which is probably not literally possible, is it? I mean, just how hot can you make an altar? But it gets real hot. And it says that the mighty men who cast Shadrach, Meshach into the burning fiery furnace were themselves burned up because they got too close. Well, when, the, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were inside the burning fiery furnace, what did Nebuchadnezzar see in there with them? One like the... Son of God. Alright, what does Son of God mean in the Bible? Not in theology. In theology, it means the divinity of Jesus Christ. And that's quite true in some parts of the Bible. But ordinarily, yet have I kept set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. What is the Son of God? He's the king. Okay. Son of man means priest basically, as it is in Ezekiel. Son of God means king. In, in Mark, which is the gospel where Jesus is presented as a new David, a man of action, it says the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, the true king. We, then we rise up. In theology, this is called by way of eminence. We rise up from that to say he's also the only begotten son of the Father. And John tells us about that. But king, what's he seeing there? He sees the true king. The fourth is like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar is being told, Neb, you're king for a while, but there is a true king. And this true king can protect his people in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. And their garments are not hurt. Their official garments of service as the prefix of Babylon province. They're not destroyed. So Nebuchadnezzar learns something new. He learns that there is a king who is bigger than he is. And he says, Praise be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his messenger and delivered his servants who were trusted in him. The word of the king they changed. Nebuchadnezzar's word was changed. 
They gave their bodies because they would not serve and would not worship any god except their own god. By me is issued a decree that every nation, language, and people that says anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in pieces shall be cut, his house shall be torn down. Because there's no other god that's able to deliver, deliver like this. Well, the message goes back to Jerusalem. Jeremiah and everybody, they're, they're singing the songs. There's, this is great. Man alive. You know, nobody out here in pagandom is allowed to say anything against Yahweh, God of Israel. This is great. What's next? Meanwhile, the Jerusalem Times says more traitors in battle. The lie has been set forth that Nebuchadnezzar is defending the true God. We don't believe it. We're going to shake off the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar. Well, there's one last story about Nebuchadnezzar. And this is a cycle in Daniel. And of course, this is in chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar walks on the top of his palace and says, boy, this is great. This is my city that I built. What does that remind you of? Who else walked on a palace and made a big mistake? David, yeah. yeah. Nebuchadnezzar is king and he commits a David-like sin. Now David grabbed a helpless girl and then uh, murdered uh, uh, a Gentile. And the whole purpose of Israel was to was to minister to and evangelize Gentiles. And David is murdering Gentiles. So that's about as bad as it gets. A Gentile convert, Uriah the Hittite. Well, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't do something quite that bad, but he says, boy, this is my city. And we have to remember, Babylon is the new Tower of Babel. And he's saying, this is, I built this with my hands. So the Lord looks down back in the Tower of Babel. It says the Lord looked down to see the tower that the men we're building that reaches all the way up to heaven. You see something down there, angels. Reaches all the way to heaven. <laughs> the Lord came down to deal with it, and it says a watcher came down out of heaven, and he cut back, cut Nebuchadnezzar down for seven periods of time. It just says seven times, probably seven months. Seven years doesn't work. Seven months of time, which is not real good. Daniel's not happy about it because. That means Daniel's protection is gone. The Chaldeans will probably take back over. It'll probably smush Daniel down again. But Daniel stands with it. helps him out. I mean, he's crazy uh, for seven months. And, and, and Nebuchadnezzar, he goes down and, and you remember what he eats? Grass. But what did Daniel eat in chapter 1? Seeds. So Nebuchadnezzar's going down to make a new beginning. He's in the wilderness. He's eating grass. And then God restores him. And we just have to end here. But we will read it. Because all of this happens before the destruction of Jerusalem. I can't prove that, but I'm convinced of it. That, that this goes back to the remnant church as well. And this is what leaves the Jews without any excuse when they continue to rebel. And we'll have to stop here for time. At the end of chapter 4, this is written by Nebuchadnezzar. You know, this is a chapter of the Bible written by a Gentile, written by Nebuchadnezzar himself. At the cutting off of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to the heavens, and my understanding returned to me. And the Most High I praised, and Him that lives everlastingly I glorified and honored. And His rule, an everlasting rule, and His kingdom from generation to generation. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And as it pleases Him, He does in the army of the heavens and among the inhabitants of the earth. And there's no one who can strike aside His hand and say to Him, What do you think you're doing? At that particular time, my understanding returned to me. And for the honor of my kingdom, my majesty and splendor returned to me. And my counselors and my great ones sought me. And upon my kingdom I was established and excellent greatness was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and honor and extol the King of the heavens, for all His works are truth and His ways are justice, and those who walk in pride He is able to abase. Now that statement goes back to Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar's converted. He's worshiping the true God. And now we're without excuse if we continue to rebel. But we did. Keep looking to Egypt. And even after Jerusalem is finally destroyed, 
And lots of people were dragged off into painful captivity in Babylon. They still looked to Egypt. And they dragged Jeremiah down to Egypt. But these people just would not repent. God says the people who go to Egypt. Now, the book of Jeremiah was written down there. We have it in the Bible, but it's a testimony against all of this. Well, that, that's what's going on in Daniel. Now, give me one more minute since we started playing. Daniel. is laid out in two parts. Seventy years and seventy weeks. Do you remember how the seventy weeks are divided? Yeah. There's seven weeks to restore Jerusalem, sixty-two weeks, and then the seventh week of years when the Messiah will be cut off. Okay? That is a very interesting verse at the end of chapter 5, beginning of chapter 6, that says Darius the Mede, when he took over the kingdom, was 62 years of age. That means that the next year, when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den, and they put a stone over it, and they rolled the stone away, and Daniel comes back out. Remember all that? That happens in the, in the year 1. Okay. That's the be one week. Okay. One week, 62 weeks, one week. And that means that there's seven weeks, I should be saying. Seven weeks before Darius is born. Okay. So their outline is the same. And what that means to us is the message to those who are going to live in the intertestamental period is that the same kind of things that happen during this time are going to happen here. There are going to be times when you'll be threatened with a burning fiery furnace, but you need to stand firm. There will be times when the kings of the Gentiles will be absolutely insane. But you need to try to help them out because they will come back to sanity. There are times when they'll call you in to speak before them and you need to keep your mouth open and tell them what God has to say and not keep it a secret. All the things that we read in Daniel 1-4 through 4 are things that we as Jews need to be doing to the Greeks and to the Romans and to the Persians and the things that we need to be doing now today as well. So that's, in a sense, a lead-in to what we'll do during the sermon, which is Daniel chapter 5 and the end of the kingdom of Babylon. But let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word, for its encouragement to us, for the great stories that we can remember, and that as we remember the stories, we remember their messages as well. Help us to be faithful people that when we stand before anybody, any kind of king that you bring before us, we will speak the truth that they need to hear, that we will stand firm for you and not go along with the rituals of this world, whatever they may be, that we may be able to guide your people uh, and speak for you. And help us not to be discouraged when many who call themselves Christians go along with the world and criticize us, but help us to stand firm knowing that the future belongs to you that you intend to disciple all nations. Now we ask that you prepare our hearts for worship. It's in your Holy Spirit as we praise you and guide us in our thoughts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.